Jesus. Wow. Mm. There's a lot of glory here. A lot of glory on you people. Sweet, sweet presence of Abba's love. Oh, wow. Just feeling that in the worship and Oh, such sweet new wine flowing through you all. Oh, oh, wow. I'm just so honored to be with you today. It's, ooh, it's your brother in Jesus. Wow. I just, I just uh, asked for your permission. I asked for your permission today. Would you grant me your permission just to, to be a little bit drunk and... Uh, just to administer the drunken joy of Jesus at this Christmas season. That especially if you're feeling weighed down and heavy, that, that joy bubbling up from your belly. I've got a big belly. Uh, sometimes people ask me, why do you have such a big belly, Eric? I said, because I'm filled with the Father, Son, and Spirit. And they need lots of room. Their big God. I just ask for your permission just to, to flow in everything that Holy Spirit, that Jesus and that Abba has for us today as children. Do I have your permission for that? Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just love, I just love catch the fire and, whoa, as... Uh, Ramesh was saying that uh, I took the Ilsam course about seven years ago and that just wrecked me. Whoa, that, that was awesome. I had a chance to minister last year at uh, Catch the Fire Ottawa with Trish and David there. Whoa, so much <laughs> loving them. Oh, wow. Jesus. I'm just going to pray first because I just love praying and just Abba, Daddy, 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 Abba. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa, for your glory, Daddy. Ba, 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 Abba. Your peace that you give through your Son, Jesus. Your joy that you give through your Son, Jesus. Your wholeness that you give through Him. Your presence by Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for being our friend, for carrying us, for releasing us, for freeing us, for just breathing everything out in and through us. That we're together, that we're one, that we're Abba's kids, that we're children together, that we're brothers and sisters, that there's no separation between any of us. That we're here together in love today. We're here together in complete wholeness and love. And we pray, I pray Abba, that it just you speak to their hearts, every heart, just through your word, Jesus. In the power of the Holy Ghost. Glory and amen. Amen. <laughs> Ramesh was saying I teach English. I, I just teach around the corner from here. I teach at Centennial College. It's hard sometimes because, you know, when you feel the glory of teaching drunk, it's, it can be difficult to, to contain. <laughs> so I teach at Centennial College just around the corner and there's a, a story that goes along with that. Ramesh shared a little bit of it and uh, I'll take you back a little ways. But being an English professor, I, I like to tell stories in different ways. So I'd like to start the story with all where good stories begin in the story itself. Jesus, uh, Ephesians 4.32 is a good part of this story, of the story of Jesus and the incarnation. This is the feast of the incarnation that God became flesh and dwelt among us. And the, one of the primary reasons that the incarnation came down and became one of us was exactly for this verse. And in knowing this verse, it reveals uh, so much freedom for us. So this verse is wow, wow. Ephesians 4.32. Somebody want to read that out loud for us? Could you read that for us, sister, please? Uh, yeah, anywhere. Uh, be kind to one another. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tender-hearted, forgiving one another is God in 
Christ forgave us. Wow, thank you. Powerful. I mean, as Christians, as believers in Jesus, we know they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yeah. So that kindness, that kindness, I mean, in the media, they don't paint Christians as being very kind people, do they? They're kind of angry and ooh, judgmental people. But be kind. Uh, we're known, we should be known uh, for our kindness, for our tender heartedness. You know, that we're people of tender hearts. Uh, not just tough love, but tender love. Forgiving people, that we're the most forgiving people on the planet, that we can forgive one another so easily. Why? Because we were already forgiven. If we know that we're already forgiven of everything, that from the cross, Jesus forgave us, for Father, Father forgive them, they know not what they do. That we've been forgiven of everything, that we can live out of that place of, I'm already forgiven. My heart is tenderized because I've got a tender Papa, a tender Abba. The Holy Spirit keeps rising up in us, Abba, with that word that he teaches us, Abba, that Jesus revolutionized the whole world through that one word, Abba. My father, my daddy, that, that tender-hearted, kind, forgiving Papa, daddy, in his warm embrace as he receives us, as his children kissing us like the prodigal father, right? When the prodigal son returned home, he was already there with arms wide open. And, and in the Greek, it's, you know, he's kissing nonstop. You're my beloved. I love you. 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 Shh, shh. Stop this sham repentance and stuff you're trying to come up with. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're my child. You're my child. Ooh, my heart is so tender for you. I love you so much. Look and look how much I gave for you. Look how much I gave for you. The greatest overpayment in history, as Ramesh was saying. But just that full abandonment of self that Father gave through His Son, Jesus, fully abandoning Himself to become one of us to forgive us of everything and pull us back into the hug. So in that place of forgiveness, of acceptance, of warmth, of love, of joy, of peace, uh, of drunken uh, party, the celebration is here, children. The celebration has come. <laughs> the joy is gone. The image and the myths that we had about Abba Father being the angry, wrathful Zeus. <laughs> beating us down. Judgmental condemnation is just taken away in Christ, in the face of Christ. Oh, we see the face of the Father. Daddy, you're so good. Jesus just shows us the face of the Father perfectly, completely. And then he turns it on us and say, you look just like my father, you look just like me. And Holy Spirit reveals that. This little verse, this forgiveness, this forgiven is given before the foundation of the world. From before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God slain. For our forgiveness, for our, it's forgiven even before we had done anything, good or bad. He's bringing us into that. And we're there always from that place of forgiveness. This verse just radically wrecks me all the time. And yesterday, <laughs> I dropped off my wife and my daughter at the distillery district, uh, not to do some drinking, but uh, she was singing in a choir. She sings in the beaches Toronto Beaches Children's Choir and they were going and singing I love this choir because they're singing <laughs> Christmas 
songs about Jesus in the distillery district. You know, it's supposedly a secular choir, but they're just singing Jesus, you know. And oh, holy night, and uh, they're singing these songs. So we drop off my wife and my uh, 12-year-old daughter to do the singing of my other daughter. We're driving along, and we're talking. She's nine, and her name's Evangeline Hope, and she's just a wonderful child. And she just, you know, what are we going to do now, Daddy? And uh, I'm thinking, well... Just feeling for Mama, you know, we call my wife Mama. Uh, we got a, there's a gift for her. Let's, let's go to the mall. So, you know, uh, the mall, <laughs> Gerard Square, a bit packed. If you, I don't know, you go to Gerard Square, packed on a Christmas time. But I don't usually like big, big crowds, but let's go. Okay, that felt that's pulling. And then while we're there, let's go to this area. And there was this table laid out there. Christmas things, because we were drawn by the Santa there. And then as we go around to the side, we start to see other things as well. And there's this lady standing there with a cane. And she's holding this ceramic rectangular type thing. And I looked over at it, and it was a, a scripture. It was like the Bible of ceramic. And there... Laid out on it was Ephesians 4, 32. <laughs> and I looked at her with the cane and there's this lady and she's, you know, uh, uh, from Africa. And uh, I said, that's a beautiful passage. And she goes, oh, yes. I said, isn't it just so good to know that we've already been forgiven? And she's just looking at it, yes, we have been forgiven. And we just start sharing the gospel to one another, back and forth. And we start sharing life stories. And she starts telling me, you know, she's from Ethiopia. And she's been in Canada. She went to, it was in Italy. And she started tell, telling her life story, you know, as people usually don't do in this city. <laughs> you know, like, you're talking to me? But uh, we we started sharing with one another and talking with one another and opening up, you know, as the, the wall or the ice wall is broken down and passing through. And she starts sharing her story and we're just receiving my daughter and I listening to her. You know, she's an older woman. And I said, what happened that got you using this cane? And she goes, well, back in the Early 1980s, I had a, when I was living in Italy, I had an accident and my ankle, and then she tried to describe what happened, but it was like the whole ankle <laughs> turned over and the bone went like that. And she said, since then, you know, it's always rubbing and I'm in constant discomfort and <sighs> I'm in a lot of pain. I haven't been able to work and all of this. So her, li her life story as pain has been her companion. As some of you have had that sad companion too. So then I started sharing, well, you know, we, <laughs> but for, Jesus has forgiven everything and he's taken away everything as well. How about we just bless you today, give you a Christmas blessing, my daughter and I. We just pray for people. <laughs> It's what we like to do. We like to bless people. It's Christmas. And she goes, please, yes. So there in the mall, other people around, I just got down on my knee. You know, I just get in the zone and don't worry about anyone else. My daughter and I, we just start praying, you know, in Jesus' name. Father Abba, we thank you for our sister when we knew her name. And we blessed her. And pain go in Jesus' name. Father, it's so easy. Thank you. Okay, uh, sister, would you mind just checking that out and see how you're feeling now? I can move it. There's no, res there's no rub. Is there any pain? No. I said, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. The Jesus you love. Oh, yes, I know I pray. He's before me all the time. I see him when I pray. I, and if I turn away, I, I put my thoughts and I see Jesus there in front of me. I said, he just reminding you now how much he loves you. You know how much he loves you. And she goes, 
who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm just a believer like you. I just believe in Jesus like you. And I don't believe there are coincidences. He just put us in one another's path. I felt led, led today to bring a gift for mama. And you're the mama. <laughs> you're the mama. We, did, we didn't buy the gift for my wife there at that time. But it was for her. So it was just that following of Holy Spirit. To be a gift everywhere we go. You know, you've got the Christmas gift living inside of you. The fullness of the Godhead bodily living inside of you. You don't lack any person, you know, the Holy Spirit, Jesus living in you, brought Papa inside of you and you inside of them. So you're lacking nothing. You know, Ephesians, what a book. What a book. I mean, Paul has his blowout at the start of that book. Where, he, you know, talk about verbal diarrhea. He just, it's not diarrhea, it's verbal glory. He just flows nonstop at this sentence in chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. You know, and he just starts flowing, flowing, flowing. Go, just spend some time in Ephesians, Ephesians 1 even, just this season, and you'll just see how blessed you are. He's called us to be adopted sons and daughters that you're lacking nothing in him. Wow. And that everywhere you go, you carry that glory, glory, glory. And you're the carriers of the glory. You're the presence on earth. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is filling the earth. It's already full. We're just making it known. We're releasing that glory in others to let Abba's kids know that they're his kids. Oh, this is what I love about Catch the Fire. You're daddy people. The heart of the Father message so strongly through Catch the Fire that everywhere we go, we're bringing brothers and sisters back into the hug. Or they're already embraced by him. He's already reconciled himself to them. Just maybe some of them keep turning away and pushing away and don't want to accept it. But he's already forgiven them. He's already reconciled them. He's not counting their trespasses against them. He's pulled them in. And now you get to say, he loves you. He's crazy about you. And he just wants to have you in that relationship. Just accept it. Just accept it. And he loves doing it through signs and wonders, through prophetic words, through any means necessary almost, it seems. <laughs> through any means necessary to reveal that glory. So I'm just going to share a bit of my story today. Uh, it's my story, but it's your story as well because our stories are one another. There's no separation between us. Jesus says in John chapter 17, Father, as I am in you and you are in me, may they also be in us. That as Jesus lives his life within the Father by the Holy Spirit, We live our lives in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Our lives are right there all the time, seated in Christ in the heavenly places. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Right now this meeting is in the heavenly places, in Christ. And our lives are together, one. We are one with one another. We might not see it here because we think, you know, this person's over here and this person's over here and we're all separated. But Jesus' prayer, which came true, is that we may all be one. That they may all be one as we are one. As I am one in you and you are one in me, may they also be one in us. In the heavenly places, the pattern for life is that our lives are so inside of one another. The ancient church called this perichoresis. That we live inside of one another. 
that there's no separation between us. So as close as I can get to Ramesh here, you know, with the Pentecostal hug, is not even a fair representation of how close we are. How deep we are inside in the heavenly places, in Christ. If the body of Christ really saw that, got it through our thick heads, right? Our separations, our walls that we place between one another and saw from the heart how deeply we are with one another. Wow. Those barriers would start to fall away. And then if others saw how deeply reconciled they are who are not believers, to share in that life as well, how beautiful that life is. Wow. To catch that vision of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of love, of union. Ooh. It's what everyone's looking for. Everyone's looking for that love. Everyone's looking for that union of belonging, of acceptance, of being who they truly are meant to be. So I'm sharing my story today and I hope this story may accelerate your story because your story is as valuable as my story. All stories are important. All stories are testimonies. You know, without testimony, we wouldn't have the testaments. You know, we have testaments because people have testified to Jesus and to what Jesus has done in their life. I love what Bill Johnson says, right? Testimony means do it again. So if my testimony, hopefully it will accelerate your testimony so you can testify to others. You know, I'm so glad. It's not because I'm, you know, super excellent Christian, but my testimony here just to share with you today is humbly to present to you so your testimony can accelerate other people's lives. So I was born into a cult. <laughs> I was born into a very uh, legalistic uh, Christian sect. Uh, my father was a pastor in the cult. And, uh, but still, they loved Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They called him Christ, though. Always called him Christ. Never, if they used the name Jesus, they had to say, Jesus Christ, and put the emphasis on the Christ. Very legalistic sect. Um, we would put uh, Seventh-day Adventists and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses to shame in our legalism. Um, it was an interesting life, full of a lot of condemnation, a lot of judgment, and uh, oppression from the law. You know, we kept a Saturday uh, Sabbath, and uh, we kept all of the old covenant holidays. Uh, we cleaned out the uh, house at Passover time of all leaven. You know, if we found a breadcrumb, then, you know, severe repentance and self-flagellation hitting one us. It was, it was that kind of life. But still, there was, in this group, a desire to, uh, you know, to learn the scriptures and, and to be people of God. So I grew up in that, and there was, there was a blessing along with that. Um, and there was some things that were not necessarily blessings. And one of them, as Ramesh said, uh, was something that I found out uh, when I started attending school. You see, when I was about uh, the first grade, I would go home at lunch uh, to see mummy. This was back in the day when it was safe for kids to walk to, to and from school. And we were living in Calgary at the time. And uh, I would go home at lunch. I took my daughters to this place this summer. You know, I, I showed them the full route. I would walk home, see mommy, have my lunch with my little sister, and then say bye to mommy, back to school. Or so she thought. Because I did one of these and ducked into the back alley, picked up sticks and stones in there for the next while. I would be amusing myself until I heard the bell ring for recess and afternoon recess, and I'd zip back, and it only took a couple of minutes if I'd run back to school, and then I could join with my friends, pull out marbles, and go back in with the other kids. Until one day, I'm sitting there in the back alleyway, and the neighbor came out and said, what are you doing here? And I said, ah. 
And the neighbor took me to mummy, and mummy took me to school. And the, there in front of the principal and my teacher, they said, where have you been these days after lunch? And this is what I said, a direct quote. <laughs> An overload of, ha, ha, ha. I, I had a breakdown there. And they say, why haven't you been coming? I don't know. I don't understand. I don't, I, I don't understand anything. You see, after lunch was math and English. And I didn't understand what was going on in those classes. So they took me off to uh, get tested at one of those big institutions, a hospital. And they, you had all these people, you know, numbers and shapes and colors and all kinds of different things and words, placing them in front of me to test me. And after going through the test, it came out with a diagnosis. You know, on the dot matrix, old dot matrix printers, those large sheets, remember those old ones, this thick stack of things uh, that were wrong with me. On the top it said LD. And I took it back to my teachers and they interpreted that LD to mean lazy and dumb. And they put me at the back of the class with the other lazy and dumb people. Now, some teachers kind of saw it that way, but others, you know, were very compassionate and kind and helpful to realize, hey, this kid has learning disabilities. Not just one. I had my one major one was called dyslexia. Have you heard of this one? Where God is a dog and dog is a God. That's where letters reverse on the page. Whole words reverse on a page. Numbers reverse. So for me to learn a language, it, for, to learn the English language reading it, it was like learning Chinese or Greek or something like that because the words would reverse on the page and it was just confusion for me. And going to school for me was like torture because it really reinforced the identity that I had in my head. Stupid. Useless. Not going anywhere. And, you know, the religious side, the condemnation and judgmentalism w went hand in hand with that, right? I had internalized that. And going through school, I just had very low self esteem. By the end of the eighth grade or through the eighth grade, I was at hospital because of. Uh, severe digestive problems, ulcers, that learning had become torture. And I'd internalized the torture. And I'd missed so much school either by being legitimately sick or faking sick. You know, the two go hand in hand. That I'd missed so much school, at that point they stopped pushing me through and failed me, Finally. I would have been a failure. Now it was confirmed. F, you're repeating the eighth grade. It was actually a good thing that I did repeat it. So I got into high school eventually and uh, I went into basic stream. I was living in London, Ontario at the time. And basic stream, still not doing so great, failing here and there. I had a, a close personal relationship with someone every year. Her name was Summer School. Summer school and I got to know each other very well. And the teachers saw me coming in there. Oh, you're here again. Eric, good to see you, you know. Uh, I, f I failed math. I don't, can't remember how many times. And I, f I failed English. I love telling my uh, college English students that, you know, hi, I'm your English professor. I failed high school English. What? <laughs> Yeah, I failed, and I failed in an epic manner. So I was failing in high school, uh, and during this time I was also getting some self-esteem, not from the religion, but from playing in bands. I was playing in new wave, rock, punk bands, kind of just being a wild child, living up to my last name, Wilding. It's a hard name for a, someone to live down. So... I was living that wild life, but school, I didn't want to be there. And the failure was putting me into this kind of depression where at times, you know those thoughts that come because of depression? How they can be pulled 
the enemy, how he tries to pull you into that dark place and put you in a place where you're going nowhere. And why not just end it, you know? You know, the thought that this, sadly, that's growing in our youth these days. How many students do I have these days with anxiety, depression, and things like that? It's, it's rampant. Ten years ago, I didn't have as many cases as I see now. But I was in that state, made it through high school somehow, thank God. I made it through high school without killing myself or dropping out. Took a couple of years off, did some traveling, and then my parents, uh, as I'm thinking what I'm going to do with my life, I, I got this excellent position as a, a preschool assistant where I was able to play my guitar and sing to little kids and just have a great time with them. But I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. And my parents said, well, why don't you apply to go to the, the, cult, no, the, uh, the Bible school that we went to? And I was kind of coming back to God at that point. I just, I had felt this pull back to God. And some of it was fear, you know, the end is coming very soon. So, uh, and you don't want to be under the judgment of God. So there was the fear aspect. And they said, why don't you apply to the Bible school? And we know some, some folks there, and they might give you a chance. So I, I got in there, not because of my SAT scores. Uh, it was in Texas. So I, I went, uh, did the SAT test, and that confirmed that I was a failure. But they gave me a chance. I got into the Bible school. First year, low grades, but passing. So that was doing a bit better. But something happened in my second year, around the time of my baptism. <laughs> Even in a cult, or sect, whatever you want to call it, God works miracles. Even as I was being baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the cult didn't believe that the Holy Spirit was a person, the Holy Spirit did something in me. He freed me of the learning disabilities. I mean, I didn't have just dyslexia. I had multiple learning disabilities. I just gradually started learning how to learn. It, it didn't come boom, but it came gradually. And my failing grades all of a sudden started to by the end of my first undergraduate degree, I was getting all A's. I stayed for a second undergraduate degree. I had great uh, impetus to stay. I had met a, a girl from Ottawa. <laughs> she had come in her freshman year. I was a senior. And I saw her coming from the dining hall looking very sad. And it wasn't just because she was wearing a Toronto Blue Jays shirt. Because <laughs> the Jays were just about to start winning at that point. But I saw that sad face and said, it's going to be my goal to cheer her up. So I met that girl and stayed for a second degree. And uh, you'll never guess what the degree was in. English. Now somebody had told me in, in high school, you're going to have an English degree. You're going to study English at college or university. I would have probably said some not so nice words to them. At least you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Well, that uh, nice Ottawa girl and I moved back from Texas to Ottawa. And uh, I got into the teacher's college at University of Ottawa. This is not because I'm intelligent. It's because God is good. I got the highest GPA of the whole teacher's college at the University of Ottawa. Yeah. And when I told my teachers, look, you know, I've been diagnosed with these learning disabilities, dyslexia, they looked at me like, you're lying, <laughs> right? I said, no, I've been diagnosed with it. Said, That's not possible because they knew the research. The research shows that if you have learning disabilities, you might learn to cope with them, but you'll have them for the rest of your life. Well, 
And that's where I could share that, you no. Know, <laughs> excuse me. God healed me of those. He set me on for a master's degree in education. And then, just as I was about to graduate from that degree, <laughs> I happened to fall into this job of teaching at Centennial College. Uh, happened to fall into it by his grace. And for the last uh, 20 something, 22 years or so, I've been teaching just over the field there at Ashtonby campus and some of the other campuses at Centennial College teaching at George Brown as well. And during that period, I went on for a second master's degree in theology and a doctorate as well in theology. So that's, I think, six degrees. Six degrees of no separation. <laughs> no separation from Jesus. But through that all, it's just been his glory and his goodness. And even through that all, I, you know, You'd think, well, with all that glory and goodness, your life is going to get straightened out. But even through that, I was still had this legalism and judgmental God going through my head. And, you know, when you have that kind of God in your, the back of your mind, which is a lot like Zeus, you live out of that fear. And your life tends to go towards judgmentalism and messing up. And I was really messing up, even though I was studying, you know, theology. Yeah, I would got, thought, if I get more information, my life's going to work out. But I kept getting more and more information, and the Holy Spirit gave me this vision a while ago of what it was, my life was like. It was like this person with a funnel in his head, finally he could learn. And all this information was going in there. I thought if I got more information, if I learned biblical Greek and studied all the ancient fathers and things like that, my patterns of addiction and sin would change. But my head kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the vision was, you know, the funnel in the head with this person with a very disproportionately large head. So every time I would try to take a step forward, my head was so big, face plant, forwards or backwards. The information didn't work a miracle. Something happened, oddly enough, while I was studying for my doctorate in theology, doctorate, <laughs> the Holy Spirit just radically started shaking me up. Because I, in the cultish days, I didn't accept Holy Spirit as a person, accepted him as a force. A lot of Christians just look at him as a force, as something that they can manipulate. <laughs> Although I had accepted him as a person at some point because that cult, it got healed as well. That cult in the early 1990s, the same time the outpouring was happening at the airport, this cult got flipped and brought into mainstream Christianity. Radically. So I had accepted the Holy Spirit. I accepted him as a person, the Trinity, but just checked the box. You know, like, it's just like, oh, okay, now I'm Orthodox believer now, like the rest of evangelical Christianity. But I didn't know Holy Spirit as a person. So Holy Spirit is guiding me along the way. My first daughter was born uh, 12 years ago. And tw two weeks after she was born, she started crying at night uncontrollably and, ah. Uh, almost unable to move and I held her all night one night the next morning we took her to the doctor and the doctor sent us to the hospital and the hospital the doctors did tests on her spinal tap and things and the results showed she had E. coli bacterial meningitis at two weeks of age she probably contact, contracted it in the birthing process and the doctors gave us that look you know there's not much we can do and if she does live she'll be severely disabled. So we didn't know what to do other than pray. So my dad, the pastor of the former cult, came in, he prayed. We prayed with him and just believed. Today, she's a perfectly normal 12-year-old. Yeah. Praise God. Thank <laughs> Jesus. She's perfectly... Perfectly normal. And you know, 
we, a couple of years later, we went into, the, into a walk-in clinic. Just she had some sickness, random sickness, and we took her into the walk-in clinic to get her tested. And the doctor who was the treating doctor, uh, pediatrici- pediatrician, uh, when she was two weeks of age, now she's about two, I said, Dr. Duke, this little girl, I don't know whether you remember her. She, was, she had E. coli bacterial meningitis. Her name is Lily Wilding. And then he goes, I remember this child. And then he fell to the floor. He's, I mean, he literally fell to the floor and started shaking his head and looking at me, eyes watering, and saying, this child should not be here. And then he got up and he started pulling a couple of the nurses into the room and saying, this child should not be here. And I said, thank you, Dr. Duke, for all you and the kids did at Toronto East General. But, you know, I believe God healed her. And he's oh, I don't know how to explain it. But I was able to testify to her, you know, to him through that. So she's a walking testimony, a living, crawling testimony. And Holy Spirit is lighting up things inside of me. I've been healed of these disabilities. My daughter's been healed. And I'm studying to get more information and still messed up. And then Holy Spirit comes in and whoosh. Hello. (laughs) You know that experience? The, The hello, I'm here. That experience, the, you know, the experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit, the release of joy of laughing on the floor uncontrollably. You know what that's like here, hopefully. Uh, the joy of the, the baptism of, and then tongues flowing with it and then leading me into just new experiences. As I'm studying to get my doctorate in theology, I'm getting radically messed up in the Holy Ghost. I can't tell my professors this, you know. Well, I, one professor I could tell. But at the U of T, you know, most are, you know, a little bit skeptical about that kind of stuff. So he, Holy Spirit comes in and starts messing me up and shifting me back from my head to my heart. This had been my default setting since I was a child. Getting me to live the foolish way of A child, unless you become as a little child, you cannot see the kingdom of God, of kingdom of heaven. To getting me to live again from my heart, from that love, and to see my identity from that place of love, of acceptance, because Holy Spirit, when he came in, he kept showing me Jesus in that radically new way. And a deeper intimacy with Jesus as the bridegroom And my bridegroom kept showing me my daddy, my Abba, and revealing that relationship that they have that I've been brought into the center of. The love of joy, of acceptance, of peace, of rest. Finally the rest that I've been striving so hard to enter. He's already given the rest. So from that place of rest, he started showing me Bring others. Bring them home. Let them know. Let them know they're loved and accepted. And do it through any means necessary. (laughs) So he started sending me out into the streets to pray for people. You know, first place, I got a vision of where to pray. At the corner of River and Queen. Has anyone been down to the corner of River and Queen? There's a big building at the corner of Queen and River. Does anyone know that building? housing something there. As I got there, I realized this is the Humane Society. (laughs) What a joke. (laughs) You know, I didn't, and I started at, you know, just going up to people randomly. "Can Can I bless you? Can I pray for you? Is there anything you need? A lot of people, you know, go away. And other people were like, oh, sure, okay. Then he started leading me to, to you all. To you all, to people like uh, Todd White. I don't know if you know Todd White. You know, hanging out with Todd White and getting to know Todd White and see what he did. And and others, guys like Pete Cabrera, I don't know if any of you have heard of him before. And people, people like that, just brothers and sisters who would kind of walk, we walk together and we learn from one another to see what's possible in the kingdom. Bethel folks, you all, 
And the miracles just started happening. As I was praying for people in public places at Gerard Square, was when I was with my kids, then he told me, I want you to start praying for your students. You know, I was in the shower at the time, about to go teach a class, getting ready. I don't want you to imagine that. But I was in the shower, and Holy Spirit says, you're going to start praying for your students. And I'm thinking, but this is, you know, a secular community college, and I'm going to get fired. And he says, I've got your back. Don't worry. So about seven years ago now, maybe a bit over seven years, I started praying for my students in class. And we've seen so many miracles. Every semester, miracles, miracles in an English class. Radical things happening. One girl had a snake earring she was wearing. You know, have seen those snake earrings that wrap around, kind of like this, wrapping around and the snake's head was going into her ear? You're thinking, pagan, pagan, pagan. <laughs> Keep the pagan away. I don't want your pagan to get on me. But I, you know, it was like, don't see people according to the flesh. Don't see them according to their paganism or their mythology, mythological view of God. See them according to love. She was completely deaf in that ear. She had had, I think, two surgeries. And the doctor said there was nothing more they could do for her. So she is watching a guy on the floor going like this because he'd been healed of scoliosis and he could finally move his, on his back without any pain. He's going, wee, wee. And then I just say, well, Jesus loves you. He's going to heal you in Jesus' name. Ear open up. <gasps> That's what happened. It popped open in an English class. The guy on the floor with his back and the other girl, the girl hugging me, <laughs> embracing me, and the other students going, what's going on here? <laughs> I've seen so many radical things over the years just with a willingness to not be afraid. We're not slaves to fear anymore. You know, in my just as a, a, rep, a cross representation, even here, right? Our city is so diverse. In my class, I've got Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, you name it. In one class, Holy Spirit was just having so much fun. <laughs> There's a Hindu woman sitting about there. I'm praying for a former Buddhist monk, Tibetan Buddhist monk for his back. <laughs> In Jesus' name, back be healed. The, the former monk goes, and he's looking at me, the pain's gone. But meanwhile, Holy Spirit just shoots through the, Muslim, the, the Buddhist monk's back and the Hindu woman who's sitting over there, she just goes like this. Wah! She, I mean, she jumps back in her seat and kicks out her leg. And she goes, And then she starts getting up like this. My leg, my knee. I've had this praying for years. And it's been healed. It's, it's gone. And the Buddhist monk's going like this. <laughs> it's just been an opportunity at that point, you know, to say, well, this is who I am. And this is what I believe. This is an open class. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But this is what I believe. And this is how it's manifesting. So I've had so many students afterwards coming up and just saying, well, you know, Christian's saying, thank you, you know. Finally, a professor who's not in hiding if he's a Christian or a Christian willing to share. I said, well, I can't do otherwise. I've been told what to do. But I say, this is for you. It's an example for you. You as a Christian, if you're a Christian, you can do this too. It's not about me and a gift. It's about us as the children of Abba. There is a gift of healing, but there is also us being believers and children of our, fa children of our Father. Amen. 
And we've seen them do some radical things in class as well. You know, I love just stepping aside and just letting them take over. And sometimes even through unbelievers as well. <sighs> there was one student who had one leg shorter than the other. You've probably seen, you know, that miracle where one leg grows out. We prayed for that student and the leg grew out. Short leg. And then I had a student who was a self-proclaimed atheist in the class. And she's a very smart young lady. And she said, okay, if this is real, you know, not just pulling on the person's leg. If this is real, I want to be one inch taller. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, you know, where's this scripture? There's a scripture saying you can't add an inch to your height or something like that. And, you know, I was thinking that. And I was thinking, well, okay. Maybe, uh, Holy Spirit, what do you say? Okay, go. So, s sit down. Okay, she sat down and we... One leg started growing. The other leg started growing. This atheist. And then she's, and she starts to say, <sighs> getting quite emotional, where were you last year? when my mother was dying of cancer. And that really struck me. You know, where was I? Where were the Christians? Those ones who say they follow Jesus and say they want to walk like him. Where were we? So it became a really an issue of the heart. So that happened with her legs. The semester passes through and... She kept, we had shot a video, it's on YouTube, you can watch it if you want on my YouTube channel. And she kept saying, put it up on YouTube, put it up on YouTube. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll put it up. So I put it up on YouTube. Toward the end of the semester, uh, last class of the semester, she said, sir, I went to my doctor for my yearly physical and he said, you're an inch taller this year than you were last year. How is this possible? She's in her mid-twenties. And she said, well, I eat my veggies. <laughs> Great sense of humor. And then she says, can I show you something on your computer? So they go over, open the YouTube, and find the video. And here's this atheist testifying to her doctor through the video and saying, this happened... And the doctor turns to her, who was uh, an Asian man about maybe this tall, says, my son, he's, he's very short and would like to grow. Do you think this person could come and pray for him? <laughs> We've seen people grow. And this has been the amazing thing. You know, sometimes people co have contacted me from Africa and places saying, I'm short and I want to grow. I said, well, I can't make you grow. But Holy Spirit can. Let's see what he does. Okay, so I'm not a kind of magician to it. But we've just seen so many miracles along the way and people's lives changed and people meeting Jesus and accepting Jesus and amazing things and just... It's been my joy to be able to travel to places and teach and equip people to pray. You know, to bring people into the maturity of sonship. In the maturity of sonship. That it's not just about the gift of healing or the gifts of healing. Because you have the gift inside of you and his name is the Holy Ghost. All authority on heaven and earth have been given to me, says Jesus. Therefore, go... And make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things I've commanded you. And I'm with you always even until the end of the age. That all authority and power have been given to Jesus and he lives inside of us. And he's just waiting to get out of us. And flow through us in, into others and on others and through others. And we've seen this you know, in the streets of India. Amazing. Or in the temples of India, Hindu priests getting healed in front of their shrines in the name of Jesus. In Hindu villages where they've never had the gospel preach, preached before. Rural villages where elephants run through in the middle of the night and, or in the evening. We had one 
place where we are told not to go because the elephants come through at night and they kill villagers. They do regularly. And the elephant was just on the outside of the, the village. You could hear it going, Wah! and we said, no, in Jesus' name, you're not coming here. Stay over there. Don't come back. But then people getting healed, the people coming out because one person comes out and gets healed and then another person comes out and gets healed in Jesus' name and they're, they're preaching this guy, Yesu, Yesu, and uh, come, come. And then I'm showing them, well, it's not about me. If you see Jesus did this once, he'll do it through you too and even through Hindus, through people who believe in many gods. The name of Jesus is so powerful that he's willing to work through anyone. He'll work through an unbeliever. He worked through Hindu children and old people, getting them. He, he worked through so many people. Because when people see this is possible and this is real, if they're an unbeliever and they see that this power in this name of Jesus and he wants a relationship, that he is love and that he is kind and tender hearted, who's not going to? At least be open to that radical encounter. I've just seen so many things. I, I could go on for hours, but I'm not going to because I think this is the, the place where we get to see the word, the living word, released. And that's what it's all about the release. We are radical releasers of love. The fear that the world tries to put in front of us, whoa, you don't step through that barrier. We don't do this in this culture. But think about it. People are doing this in China. They're doing it in Laos, where if they're caught, they're going to be executed. What do we have to fear here? That somebody's going to fold their arms, or they're going to look down their noses at us or laugh at us. There's a boldness in the Holy Spirit that if we just say, okay, what's possible? Let's go. Let's go. Let's do it. You're going to see so much more. I think there's so much more. You're already at a level where you're seeing things. You see so much more. He wants to release so much more. And if we're, we're willing to go, wow, we'll see the greater things. I just want to end with this scripture. In John 14, Jesus said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, hey, Believe me, because of the works, the miracles, the signs, the wonders. Then he says, Amen, Amen, I say to you. He's making a prophecy. Now, let me just ask you a quick question. How many of you here believe that Jesus was a false prophet? Just show of hands, please. Anyone? Okay, how many of you believe that Jesus was a prophet and even greater than a prophet, the Son of God? How many of you believe what he says comes to pass? Amen. amen, okay. So he says, amen, amen, I say to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, 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 you. The one who believes in me, and it's not that you throw your faith at him, to get your faith inside of him, but believe from inside of him. You're inside of Jesus. You're in Christ. You're in him and he's in you. The one who believes from within me will do the works that I do and in fact, he uses the word in fact to confirm it, underline, in bold, <laughs> will do greater works than these. Because I'm going to the Father. It's because Jesus has gone home to Daddy. And he's taken us up with him. When he rose, we rose with him. And where he is, we're seated in him. And that what we do is, as Bill Johnson says, from heaven to earth. Everything we do is seated in the heavenly places and is flowing out to earth.
He's made it a promise. Not that you have to hold him to it, but he just wants to do it. He just wants his glory to, the knowledge of his glory, the experience and the relationship. He's calling everyone to the relationship. Not for the power itself, but for the relationship. He's all about the love. For God is love. He is a relationship. Abba, Jesus, and Holy Spirit is a relationship, an eternal relationship. Not focused on self, focused on other. And we're brought into that relationship, that face-to-face -face relationship. You're always there. You're made in the image and likeness of God. You look just like Jesus. No matter how old or how young you are. No matter how old. You might think, well, my, my days are over, you know, coming to the end. I've been with some radical golden year people on the streets <laughs> where they're like pit bulls. <laughs> you go, oh, ha, ha, Jesus loves you so much, you know. 70, 80 year old women, about this small, going up to big biker dudes, you know, in black leather jackets and saying, Jesus loves you so much. And their big guys are going, oh, those demons are manifesting in Jesus' name, be free, honey. You know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, I feel better. <laughs> You're a radical releaser. I'm just here as an encourager today. Encourager. So thank you for listening to my story. The sermon is over. The glory, let's release some of the glory, the glory that's already in you. Shoulder. Who's been having shoulder problems? Whoa. Okay. So, shoulder people. Okay. Jesus has shouldered your burden. You're equally, why don't you come up? Do, do, do. What's your name, dear? May. May? Oh, May. Which shoulder is it? Okay. And it's going through here? It's pinching and then it's coming through my arm. My arm's going up. Okay, your arm's going How long has that been going on? For about three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. Ah, May, can I just have your hand? This one? Patty cake, patty cake, baker's man. Bake me a cake just as fast as you can. Roll it and pat it and mark it with a May. <laughs> and put it in the oven for Jesus and May. You're such a good little girl. Jesus said, just kiss you on the shoulder. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Jesus, may I. See, I love this, you know, when believe, it happens to believers, but when it happens to unbelievers in class, that that's, gets radical. May, can you move your arm around like you're, like you're swimming now? What are you feeling, May? If you can get through the laughter. Can you give us a thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up! If it's, if it's all gone, can, if it's all gone, give us two thumbs up. It's all gone, two thumbs up. Oh, wow. Isn't that so irreverent, patty cake? That's good. It's just so, so easy. You know, we make it so religious about, that's, sometimes I, I, when I'm walking with people on the streets, Christian believers, they get upset with me because they want to, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out, spirit of, you know, whatever the name is, they throw it out. So then when something comes along like that, patty cake, I didn't, I didn't think of that. It just kind of came. Just to show you how easy it is, it, it, uh, it is, uh, Oh, wow. Oh. Glory, glory, glory. Whoo. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, Lord. Okay, so, 
Shoulder people, just raise, raise, your, uh, raise your hands. Or you can raise your other hand if you'd like. Um, so here's what I want you to do. Just uh, turn to a shoulder person. Uh, it could be one person. It could be a group of you. And just, uh, you, know, you know the Randy Clark deal, right? Uh, but just keep it so simple, okay? Uh, let Holy Spirit flow. Don't make it religious. Uh, make it Jesus-centered, but do something unusual. And then have the person do something that they couldn't do before. It's easy to fall back into patterns and methods. You're not Methodists here, I, I don't think, right? Although the United Church came out of the Methodist Church, but <laughs> you're not Methodists. Well, Met Methodists are amazing believers. Okay, so then try to move it Shoulder, former shoulder uh, people. Check it out. See if you're feeling anything different. <laughs> Is good? Any pain there now? How long were you feeling that pain? And there! Oh. Jesus! <laughs> Eight years! Snow <laughs> Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Okay, who else, who else? How are you feeling, dear? Does it feel different? Not quite. Does it feel any different? It's a rotator cuff tear. Rotator cuff tear. How, how long have you had that? 20 years. 20 years. That's no fun. At least 20 years. Okay. Are you feeling the same or different? It's easier. Praise God. Okay, go again, sister. Now, the thing is, don't just leave a person there. You know, Jesus never left a person half done. He, uh, the blind man, you know, he prayed a second time. The first time he saw trees. Right? Th that's a great encouragement for us. If Jesus prayed more than once, we can do it too. So, sister, thank you. Okay, check it out again. How's it feeling? Don't feel pressure, you know, and spotlight and everything. But. So feel, feel any different? Still stiffness. Still stiffness, okay. Okay, go one more time. Please. How about any, somebody else with shoulder uh, issues feeling something different? Are there other shoulder people? Oh, you're feeling it? Glory, glory. Here we go. Thank you, Lord. You know, 20 years is a very short time in the kingdom. It's like just, oh, yesterday. It's gone. Let's try it again. Jesus. What's that? Stronger. Mighty, mighty Jesus. Thank you, almighty God. Thank you, Abba Father. What's your, what's your name, sister? Natalie. Natalie, okay. Okay, can you stand up just for a second, Natalie? Is that okay? <laughs> Do you ever hear that song? Uh, there was a, there was a, there's an old... There's, Okay. Yes. Well, okay. He, he uh, Holy Spirit was just giving me a song for you. Uh, yes. And it seems rather unconventional. <laughs> it came out, I think, in 1978 by a band called The Village People. <laughs> you ever heard that song, YMCA? <laughs> it goes like this. Can you raise your arms? Why? Y, go like this, M, C, A. So YMCA stand, originally stood for young men's, and there's a YW as well, 
Christian association. Right? Check out your arms, huh? You couldn't do that? YMCA. YM. No, that's just what I was feeling. So let's watch for it. How, how much better would you say you feel now? Feels easier? Is there pain there now? A little bit tight? It was locked up. So you, could, you couldn't do that before because of the lock? It's much better. How much better would you say? Like, if you could give a number. Eight. 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 Wow. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's keep, keep, keep praying for her. Natalie. Thank you, sister. That's kind of, uh, kind of weird. Jesus. He does some funny things. You know, that Lord. He just, he, he tells the best jokes, you know. Jesus. He's the funniest man who ever lived. He is. I mean, he is fully human. We tend to think of Jesus walking around and, you know, be healed. <laughs> Pick up your mat and walk. Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his companions. I can just imagine Jesus walking around Jerusalem. You know. Be healed, you know. And that we carry that gladness. And it doesn't have to be a somberness as we pray for people. Mm. Just so easy. You don't want to close your eyes. You're just healed in Jesus' name. Tell a joke, a laugh. God loves you so much. And then just make it easy. It's simple. People are afraid of religion. They're not afraid as much of authenticity and joy and love that just will flow naturally from you. So if you find yourself in that situation, don't fall back in the religious mindset of, oh, I have to do this. It has to be this way. <sighs> just keep it simple. And Jesus is there. Even if you don't use his name, he is there. And then afterwards, boom. You know? Sometimes people will react if you're going to use his name right away. And when they receive it, then then, oh, wow. Wow. Jaw. Jaw or teeth. Does anyone have jaw or teeth trouble? Has anyone had jaw or teeth trouble? Like, that's, that's your brother? Okay. Uh, would you mind, brother? And just... Whoa. See, why I said that was, you know, Holy Spirit can speak to you in many different ways, and I'm sure you, many of you know this already, but he often speaks to me through my body. I've got a lot of body for him to use. So he'll speak to me. Th so sometimes I'll feel like a, a twitch or a pain in that area, and I realize it's not my pain, so who is it for? Right there. So let him speak to you however he speaks to you and in multiple ways. Uh, and make yourself available and, and risky to... You're standing with somebody or you're at the restaurant when we were at the restaurant or I was at the restaurant this past week. I keep getting net words for necks and our waitress got, had neck problems. I was with some friends who I'd met at a, I don't know if you've heard of this rock band Corn, Brian Welch, he's a friend of mine. We go and pray for people after his heavy metal concerts. So, you know, people going, ah, rah, 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 you know, and we're praying, you know, Jesus, Jesus. So Brian plays in this band, Korn, heavy metal band, and he's radically saved and prays for his, his audience afterwards, and so many people get saved, healed, delivered. So we had prayed for this couple um, uh, three years ago. She had, had broken her tailbone while giving birth. She got healed, flushed by Holy Spirit, uh, lighted up, and they got set on a new course with Jesus. Three years ago, that happened. They'd been to a few other corn concerts and started praying with us at the corn concerts. And this week, they came to Toronto from south, southern Ontario. And there we were just at our, having a beer. And the waitress comes over. Oh, you've got neck problems. And then, you know, you're just able to do that. Just he makes connections. 
And so this is uh, what I was sharing with them. He just makes connections with people. You make yourself available when you feel it. Look, be willing to look foolish. <laughs> Dr. Wilding. <laughs> I'm a big fool in my class. But I've got the title. <laughs> that makes it legitimate. But just be willing to do that. And if you feel something in yourself, you just say, you know, hey, have you been feeling any, any pain? Maybe like in your hand or in your jaw or something like that. How are you feeling, brother? It moved? Is it gone? No pain? Praise God! Thank you, Jesus. Definitely. Okay. So let's do that. How are we doing for time here? Oh, yes, I've gone well over time. This is the bad thing about saying there was a wider strip for landing. At least at college, they cut us off right on time. So what I'm going to do, pray for you, okay? Pray for boldness. I'm going to just pray that if you want to receive it, that it just flows out, okay? This is, I love what Sean Bull says. You know, if you've heard Sean speaking, it's just, it's all about passing it on. It's pay it forward. If everyone started doing this, the world would be transformed. If every believer caught sight of this, yeah. transformed, the glory is flowing all the time. It doesn't come and go. You've all got the anointing inside of you. It's the Holy Ghost. Jesus is glorified. So over Christmas, this is a great time. And this is why I think Ramesh had me here. So when you go to your parties, when you go to your families, you know, they might think of you as Christian. <laughs> you know? But now you have a chance to make it simple, keep it easy, and then, hey, watch this. Let me show you something. As, sometimes I don't even say what I'm going to do. I say, watch this, give me your hand. Or watch this, and I just put my hand on their shoulder, and, you know, if they're, they're complaining, people complain a whole lot, right, about, oh, this hurts, so that hurts. I say, watch this. Try to move that. <gasps> How did you do that? Jesus, he did it. You don't have to make it religious. And afterwards, then they get the gospel. And then they start, okay, I don't know how to explain that. But, and even if they don't accept Jesus at that mo moment, they walk away and they're thinking, how in the world? So I'm going to release that boldness in you that's already there, overflowing. Some of you are already walking in that boldness. And in the joy and the glory, okay? So just bow your heads and close your... No, you don't have to do that. <laughs> when they tell you to do that, it's almost like you feel like you're putting a method. You can look you know, Jesus when he stood praying. So let's just look to daddy. 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 Everyone just say, Abba. Abba, we're your kids. Daddy, Abba, we love you. We love you, daddy. You don't withhold anything from your children. We're all your children. No one's more your favorite than others, although Jesus is kind of that way. But you, you love us even as you love Jesus. Jesus, you've told us that. You, that Daddy loves us in, even in the same way that you love Jesus. And Daddy, you want all your children to look like Jesus. They already do. They already do, Papa. I thank you, Daddy, that you've made them that way. That they look the, as new creations, full of you, Holy Spirit, our best friend, our guide, our teacher, our crazy comedian. Get crazy through us, Holy Spirit, to reveal Jesus at this Christmas time. Every day is the birth of Christ in and through people. Let them see the new birth through miracles, through signs, through wonders, through prophetic words, through healing, through the gospel. The gospel is indeed good news. Papa, Help us, give us the boldness to preach the, share the good news. Not just preach it, but share, share it by living it. And where our fear tries to rise up, Daddy, help us to see where the enemy is trying to put that wall in front of us so that we can walk through the walls. Father, we walk with Jesus through every wall. We walk on water. We walk through walls. We walk through the fire. We have no fear. As a song we sang, we have no fear. We are not prisoners of fear. We are sons of you, Daddy. We are sons of the Most High God. 
We are sons of the creator of all things. And we thank you, Abba, that all power in heaven on earth has descended and filled each and every child here today. Whoa! Holy Spirit, so, oh, oh. so much love and so much joy. Holy Spirit, we thank you for radical encounters that people will experience you in new and radical ways to take away pains, sorrows, heartaches, to see new creation possibilities in their lives. That they, no matter the age, how old or how young, they are new creations, eternal sons, brides of Christ, full of the fullness of God, Father. We can rest in you, Daddy. We rest, rest in your arms everywhere we go. We're driving down the highway, sitting at home watching TV, at the malls, with family, with friends, with strangers in jails, traveling as missionaries. Father, thank you. I thank you. I thank you for this house. I thank you for Catch the Fire. Father, that the fire would continue to increase and just be a raging inferno of your love consuming the world. In Jesus' wonderful Christmas name. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive our King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and love. Nations song. Sing in tongues. Of his righteousness, wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders of his love. Merry Christmas, my brothers and sisters.